Okay, Transcendental Skepticism today is our subject. By Transcendental Skepticism, I mean the skepticism of the Transcendentalists among the American Unitarians. Chief among them is Ralph Waldo Emerson, and so he will be the main person on whom we are focusing today, and in particular his controversy with the more conservative Unitarian scholar Andrews Norton. You'll remember that earlier in the course I described Transcendental Skepticism briefly as a movement centered in the United States, and in particular at Harvard, um, sometimes known as New England Transcendentalism. This movement exposed very deep divisions among the American Unitarians. There were several people who lined up more or less on Emerson's side of the argument, uh, Ripley and Hedge and Putnam among them, and on the conservative side, uh, Andrews Norton, uh, John Gorham Palfrey, and Andrew Preston Peabody. Uh, this was a movement heavily influenced by German skepticism. Emerson himself had traveled to Germany and studied there and absorbed some German skepticism. If you were alert, you even saw perhaps the word mythos coming up in something that we read. Can't imagine where he got that, can you? And his Divinity School address, which he delivered and had published in 1838, served as a flashpoint of the debate. But to understand transcendental skepticism properly, again, we have to go back in time and study the roots of it and see how it came about as a reaction to a particular kind of orthodox defense of the supernatural element in Christianity. To understand that, let's go back to the work of John Locke, the English physician and philosopher, a confidant of Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, and other members of the Royal Society. Locke gave us the classic statement of what is known as British empiricism in his essay concerning human understanding, published in 1689. This was an attempt to lay out the philosophical underpinnings for a view of nature that would be at odds with the standard Cartesian view, which many scholars on the continent, like Christian Huygens, were at least broadly in sympathy with. Locke and Newton stood on one side of a great divide with people like Huygens and Leibniz on the other. And if you've studied the history of philosophy at all, you'll remember how Locke's empiricism became the dominant view in England for quite some time, modified by successive thinkers, but always looming in the background. Locke's thought on religious matters also looms in the background of this discussion, and his enormous influence helps us to see how various parts of the argument played out. Locke also wrote a book in 1695 called The Reasonableness of Christianity. It is not a particularly deep or rigorous piece of work, but it's an attempt on his part to lay out a simple version of Christianity, so simple that some people accused him of not uh, agreeing in the doctrine of the Trinity, although he really just doesn't address that there. But he has particular views on miracles, which are well exhibited in both of these works, though only briefly. Here's what Locke says on the relation between reason and special revelation. This is a direct quotation from Book 4, Chapter 19 of his essay concerning human understanding. Reason is natural revelation whereby the eternal Father of light and fountain of all knowledge communicates to mankind that portion of truth which he has laid within the reach of their natural faculties. Revelation is natural reason enlarged by a new set of discoveries communicated by God immediately, which reason vouches the truth of by the testimony and proofs it gives that they come from God. That last phrase is very important. Reason does not determine that revelation is true by seeing the intrinsic attractiveness of revelation. These are matters which may be beyond our scope, beyond our ability to verify, beyond our ability to judge. Reason judges the credentials of the one who comes purporting to be a messenger from God. If the credentials check out, the message is to be received. This approach is absolutely fundamental to orthodox 
English thought in the next century and more. So again, reason is natural revelation. Revelation is natural reason enlarged, telling us things that our natural faculties alone could not tell us. Now, standing in opposition to this kind of view is Baruch Spinoza, the Dutch philosopher who was declared to be harem, expelled from his synagogue in Amsterdam in 1656. Spinoza was a forerunner of modern biblical criticism and an early figure in the radical enlightenment. Um, he's classified in different ways. Some people classify him as a pantheist, others as an atheist. Norton is certainly going to be classifying Spinoza as an atheist, and since he sees many similarities between Spinoza's thought and Emerson's thought, he thinks those similarities are enough to classify Emerson that way as well. Here's what Spinoza says on miracles in his Tractatus. Nothing then comes to pass in nature in contravention to her universal laws. Nay, everything agrees with them and follows from them. For whatsoever comes to pass comes to pass by the will and eternal decree of God. That is, as we have just pointed out, whatever comes to pass comes to pass according to laws and rules which involve eternal necessity and truth. Nature, therefore, always observes laws and rules which involve eternal necessity and truth, although they may not all be known to us, and therefore she keeps a fixed and immutable order. Still continuing the quotation from Spinoza, the only alternative is to assert that God has created nature so weak and has ordained for her laws so barren that he is repeatedly compelled to come afresh to her aid if he wishes that she should be preserved and that things should happen as he desires, a conclusion, in my opinion, very far removed from reason. So what is Spinoza's point? There's an immutable natural order it represents the will of God. The laws of nature are, in fact, the will of God, made visible and expressed in the regularity and harmony of nature. Anything that is not one with that is not one with the will of God. It cannot proceed from the will of God. Spinoza's thought probably had an influence on Matthew Tyndall whose work, Christianity as Old as the Creation, was the best representation of the full range of arguments deployed in the deist controversy. Coming in 1730, it was one of the later works in the deist controversy, and Tyndall picks up many strands of argument, Spinoza's argument among them. Note that Tyndall is writing before Hume. Hume is just a teenager at the time that Tyndall's work comes out. So how does Tyndall argue? Well, here's a summary, not a direct quotation. Because God is unchangeable and perfect, nothing can proceed from him but what is perfect. So we're arguing now from the attribute of God of unchangeableness, of perfection, immutability. So the original religion propounded for man's happiness, since God himself needs nothing, it must be for man's happiness, must be unchangeable. And nothing can be added to it by a later revelation. So there are page references there, and we do have, I believe, this edition in the library. John's probably looking to see whether it's up or not. With that background in mind, let's come to Ralph Waldo Emerson, an essayist and poet and public lecturer, champion of the position that he called individualism. Everything is about the individual. This is the most important thing that we can know. He's the fountainhead of the American Transcendentalist Movement and was a mentor to Thoreau. There are three key works by him, his uh, essay, Nature, his essay, and address, The American Scholar, and the Divinity School Address. All of them are collected in an 1849 publication uh, called Nature, Addresses and Lectures. And those are the first three pieces in that volume. So this is a very important 
place for us to stop and look to see how American transcendentalism arose. Let's look at something briefly in each of those. Here's a statement of Emerson's individualism from his lecture, The American Scholar. The scholar is that man who must take up into himself all the ability of the time, all the contributions of the past, all the hopes of the future. He must be an university of knowledges. If there be one lesson more than another which should pierce his ear, it is, the world is nothing, the man is all. In yourself is the law of all nature, and you know not yet how a globule of sap ascends. In yourself slumbers the whole of reason. It is for you to know all. It is for you to dare all. Inspirational stuff to certain members of that generation of Americans right around the beginning of the Victorian era. Everything depends on the individual. Oliver Wendell Holmes, the American jurist, called this the American scholar's declaration of independence. This essay was the essay that he thought most characterized what was fresh and new and vital and forward-looking in the American mind. Here's a longish quotation. I've broken it out across a couple of slides from Emerson on the relationship between nature and religion. This is not yet, I think, from the Divinity School Address. Look at the way that he talks about the intersection of nature and religion. The advantage of the ideal theory over the popular faith is this, that it presents the world in precisely that view which is most desirable to the mind. It is, in fact, the view which reason, that's his capitalization, both for speculative and both speculative and practical, that is, philosophy and virtue take. For seen in the light, light of thought, the world is always phenomenal, and virtue subordinates it to the mind. Idealism sees the world in God. It beholds the whole circle of persons and things, of actions and events, of country and religion, not as painfully accumulated atom after atom, act after act, in an aged creeping past but as one vast picture which God paints on the instant eternity for the contemplation of the soul. Therefore, the soul holds itself off from a too trivial and microscopic study of the universal tablet. It respects the end too much to immerse itself in the means. It sees something more important in Christianity than the scandals of ecclesiastical history or the niceties of criticism and very incurious concerning persons or miracles and not at all disturbed by chasms of historical evidence, it accepts from God the phenomenon as it finds it as the pure and awful form of religion in the world. Language like this drove people like Andrews Norton to the edge of madness. They could not believe that anyone could, with such pretentious fluff, throw away the religion of their fathers. Now to the Divinity School address in particular. Here's Emerson on miracles. Quote, the word miracle, as pronounced by Christian churches, gives a false impression. It is monster. It is not one with the blowing clover and the falling rain. I suggested in the reading questions on this essay that you might want to compare Voltaire. So here's a quotation from Voltaire's Philosophical Dictionary. What's the true meaning of miracle? Well, it's something admirable. And Voltaire then gives us some examples. The stupendous order of nature, the revolution of a hundred millions of worlds round a million of suns, the activity of light, the life of animals. Those admirable things you might justly call miracle, but what if you use it in the popular sense, as pronounced, Emerson would say, by Christian churches. Well, a miracle, in that sense, is the violation of mathematical, divine, immutable, eternal laws. Notice the resonance with the language of Spinoza here. By the very exposition itself, a miracle is a contradiction in terms. A law cannot at the same time be immutable and violated. So by definition, miracles are ruled out. Back to Emerson again, to aim to convert a man by miracles 
is a profanation of the soul. A true conversion, a true Christ, is now, as always, to be made by the reception of beautiful sentiments. So much for doctrine, so much for miracles. It's beautiful sentiments and, as he puts it, a sweet natural goodness like thine and mine that makes the true conversion of the soul. And it is to such beautiful sentiments that we should aspire and by such sentiments that we should be led wherever they might happen to lead us. But nobody was more outraged than Andrews Norton. He was a Harvard theologian and leader of the conservative wing of Unitarianism. He resigned from his teaching position in 1830 to focus on his scholarly work. Um, but when Emerson, eight years later, gave this address, Norton sprang into action and managed to get himself set to give an address to more or less the same group in the following year. Uh, later in the whole struggle against these guys, Norton the Unitarian would reach out to the Presbyterians at Princeton Seminary, people like Hodge, and request that they lend him aid in fighting the tide of German infidelity that he saw coming in and washing away the faith that had been in common to him and to the Presbyterians. Uh, notwithstanding their differences on Christology and some other critical matters. Two key passages from Norton's rejoinder to Emerson stand out. First, he says, by a belief in Christianity, we mean the belief that Christianity is a revelation by God of the truths of religion, and that the divine authority of him whom God commissioned to speak to us in his name was attested in the only way in which it could be, by miraculous displays of his power. Two things here. First of all, recall John Locke's statement. Revelation is natural reason enlarged by a new set of discoveries which God Almighty has made and which are vouched for by the evidences that they come from God. Miracles Norton is saying, are the only way that we can have something vouched for in a way that will clearly exclude every other source. There's a strong parallel between this line of thought in Norton and William Paley's preparatory remarks in his view of the evidences of Christianity. If you're interested in this line of argument, Paley's preparatory remarks are an important place to go because he's responding there directly to David Hume and Norton sees this attack on the bulwarks of Christianity as being directly an attack on the only way that we could have a message from God authenticated and be assured that it really was from God. Again, direct quotation from Norton's discourse on the latest form of infidelity. But infidelity has but assumed another form. He'd just been talking about the sort of vulgar, common infidelity of Thomas Paine and noting that that's no longer uh, as much of a threat as it had seemed before. Whether Norton was aware of what was happening among the working classes in America is a different question. But he says it has assumed, but assumed another form, and in Europe and especially in Germany, has made its way among a very large proportion of nominally Christian theologians. Certainly, he has Schleiermacher in view. He may have been aware of Strauss by this time. It would not be implausible. Um, but Schleiermacher, who had himself been heavily influenced by the deists, was almost certainly a focal point of Norton's criticism. Among them are now to be found those whose writings are most hostile to all that characterizes our faith. So they're nominally Christians, but in fact, they're hostile to all that characterizes our faith. The latest form of infidelity, again, another direct quotation, is distinguished by assuming the Christian name while it strikes directly at the root of faith in Christianity and indirectly of all religion by denying the miracles attesting the divine mission of Christ. If you cut that off, you have an ethical system, but nothing more. That root is what holds Christianity in place nourishes it, 
is the guarantor of all that is living. If you cut off the root, the tree may seem the same for a short while, but in time it will surely die. Because he sees Spinoza and particularly Hume as lying behind this kind of critique that Emerson is pursuing, Norton takes some time to talk about Hume's argument and in particular about Hume's characterization of Christianity. So here's a quotation from Norton that embeds a quotation from Hume. In the conclusion of his essay, he says, in mockery, then he gives a quotation ending with this part, our most holy religion is founded on faith, not on reason, and it is a sure method of exposing it to put it to such a trial as it is by no means fitted to endure. Then Norton picks up again. What Hume said in derision has been virtually repeated, apparently in earnest, by some of the modern disbelievers of miracles who still choose to profess a belief in Christianity. Interesting little side note here. Um, in Walter Lowry's Short Life of Kierkegaard, there's a passage from Georg Hamann uh, who endorses Hume's scornful description at the end of his essay of miracles. And he endorses it as, quote, orthodoxy and a testimony to the truth from the mouth of an enemy and persecutor. So when Norton says that this has been repeated in earnest, he's not kidding. And whether he had Haman or someone else in mind, there certainly were people who almost immediately picked it up and took it seriously. There are people who are saying that to this day. Just briefly, a uh, comment on Norton's character. Peabody uh, wrote a work called Harvard Reminiscences, and although it doesn't have much matter on miracles and prophecy per se, it does tell us something about how the man was viewed. Here's what he says uh, from an intimate friend. I've never known a firmer belief than his in the divine mission and authority of Jesus Christ. Indeed, it seemed in him more than belief, it was knowledge. I doubt whether he felt any more confident assurance of the events daily occurring under his own eyes than of those which he supposed to have occurred within the cognizance of the apostles of Christ. The truths of the Christian revelation which transcend the sphere of human knowledge, he received implicitly on the authority of him whom he believed to be an accredited teacher from God. The accreditation, of course, being the miraculous signs that Jesus brought a message direct from God the Father. In this faith, he was serenely happy in his years of declining strength and passed under the death shadow with a hope based not on his own speculations, but on what he regarded as the infallible testimony of one who knew. A few resources, if any of you want to pursue this particular line of historical inquiry. There's an article published with just initials, G-E-E, -E, I think this is George E. Ellis, called The New Controversy Concerning Miracles. And I've given you a reference there. I can give you a link as well. It's broadly sympathetic to Norton's side, but the really interesting thing is that it gives specific references to quite a number of pamphlets that went back and forth, people attacking Norton on behalf of Emerson, Norton responding to these people. So the whole thing played out almost like a blog war in slow motion with longer and longer pieces being put out um, until the whole thing settled out with people separating off into different camps. It was during this period that Norton reached out to Richard Waitley, the author of Historic Doubts, Archbishop of Dublin, uh, unimpeachably orthodox in his Trinitarian faith. So they disagreed on Christology, but there are letters still in the Harvard archives that passed between the two of them in which the two old lions uh, make common cause against the influx of German infidelity. There's also a more recent paper, which we can't put in the database, but if you have access to a, an academic library and are interested in following this up, uh, by Robert Habeck, and I, I cited that earlier as a reference for one of the quotations, Emerson's Reluctant Foe, Andrews Norton and the Transcendental Controversy. You will see, if you read this, a very sympathetic 
portrayal of the controversy and attempt to get it right. There are some other attempts to portray the controversy that get things ludicrously wrong, so Habak is a better starting place than those, if that's something that interests you.